and exciting talks, uh, which I think you're really going to enjoy. My name is Robert Hackett, and I'm from the Project Management Office in HGNS. And I think uh, these, these are going to be a little bit unusual. We're going to go from tragedy to disaster, um, veering into the research world, and one of the great pioneers that the Minister mentioned earlier on, Tom Crean, from not too far away. And uh, let's see what we can learn from the, the fascinating talks that are going to come up. So first of all, um, we're going to have one of HE in its own. Uh, I think uh, she's not going to be too upset if I call her a veteran of HE in it and uh, of HE in it conferences. So we have Anna Wilson. Many of you will know Anna Wilson. She's a technical architect in the service architecture team. And one of the things she's been working on in recent times is disaster recovery. So our industry is still pretty young and there's still a lot that we can learn from other industries and part of that uh, learning is from disaster recovery. So I'd like to welcome Anna Wilson to the stage now, and she's going to tell you about the Halifax explosion of 1917 and what parallels and learnings we can take from that. So welcome, Anna. Good morning. This one gets a little bit heavy if you decide partway through that you want to um, nip out and take a call. I'm not going to judge. This is Canada. Um, this bit here is Nova Scotia. If we go in a bit closer, this is where the city and port of Halifax are. And if we go closer still, today we're going to talk about two ships in the area around Halifax Harbour. One of our ships, the Mont Blanc, is coming in from the open sea to the south and the other is leaving the harbour from this bay in the north. They're going to meet in a spot in the middle called the Narrows, and from the name you can guess which part it is. The two ships today were sailing in the harbour on December the 6th, 1917. And one of them, the one coming from the south, the Mont Blanc, was carrying high explosives. So first we need to talk about what are high explosives. Um, with something like petrol or propane, uh, to, have, to have some sort of ignition there, you need uh, an, oxy an oxidizer to get the reaction. Usually this is oxygen, it doesn't have to be. And then the severity of the explosion that you get depends on how quickly the fuel and the oxidizer combine. High explosives aren't like that, they come with everything built in. Uh, depending on the explosives, they can explode just by getting too hot. Some of them will explode just from a good solid bump. The Mont Blanc was stuffed to the gills with this stuff. It had 62 tonnes of um, gun cotton, 250 tonnes of TNT, 2,366 tonnes of picric acid. Um, one, when I was researching this, one of the books that I was reading by, by someone called Bacon said, picric acid, uh, I was never familiar with it, I knew nothing about it. Turns out if you have some in the lid of a jar and you turn the jar, um, that can be enough. <laughs> that can be enough to blow up your lab. This is serious stuff. But it is manageable. Um, as long as you don't have fire, as long as you handle it carefully, you're going to be okay. So there's ways to manage that. We, we, we have ships that don't go on fire all the time. Um, it was carefully sealed, it was packed, it was secured. You know, there's proper ways to handle this. And then, the thing about 1917 is this is, this is war, wartime. And in wartime, a lot of the rules kind of get broken. Um, this was a French ship and the order came in to fill all the shit, all the space remaining on the ship with a thing called benzol. Now, you know, just from the, the ends in there, this is not a nice molecule. Um, this is stuff, it was a liquid, it was used as an aviation fuel, and that stuff could, could ignite with just a spark. So they ended up taking this already full ship and just stacking 500 barrels of this stuff just into whatever space they could find. They secured it with canvas straps and that was supposed to, to do. Um, now, that said, these people are not idiots. Um, there was a, uh, 
a plan for what to do on a fire. There weren't fire extinguishers, but the plan was we are surrounded by water, scuttle the ship. Uh, the, you're not gonna get, get the ship back anyway. Scuttle the ship, run for the lifeboats. Um, now, usually there are other things a ship like this would do. You would fly a flag to say that I am carrying explosives, please be careful with me. Um, normally you wouldn't even be allowed into a harbour in a, a, a populated space like a city like Halifax. But in wartime, different rules apply. Our other ship is the Emo. And unlike the Mont Blanc, which was on its way to Europe, this one was, was on its way back from Europe. Um, it was a neutral ship. It was um, empty. It just needed to make a refueling stop. It needed to load some coal in Halifax before moving on to New York. Um, and its job was to bring relief supplies to Europe. It even has Belgian relief written on the side. Um, so that was kind of its, its way of asking nicely, please don't shoot at me. One other thing we need to know about what happened that day is kind of the rules of the road, but for the sea, which are the collision regulations. Now, when I started researching this talk originally, I thought, OK, um, we've seen lots of other talks like this. We look into the aftermath of this disaster. We'll see what was learned from it, what rules changes um, took place, uh, what was learned about moving ships, see if we can take some of those lessons for our own industry. But really, for today's discussion, there are only really two relevant rules, and they are very, very simple. Keep right and don't speed. And these aren't even super, super strict. Um, ships have a lot of momentum. Even when going at slow speed, they have so much uh, weight in them, so much mass, that the momentum is very high. So a captain is going to have to make a decision minute to minute about, about how they're going to respond to what they see. So if, it, if in their judgment it's safer to go uh, to the left of a ship, to the port side, um, you can do that. That is not like strictly forbidden like it would be driving on a road. Um, and there's conventions about how to handle that situation. There's conventions about how to notify other ships with your whistle and things like that. So let's take a look at what happened. The Mont Blanc coming from the south was going slowly and carefully. The Emo in the north was just making a beeline for the Narrows at speed. But it was steering around a couple of other ships and that put it on the wrong side of the channel. Now the captain of Mont Blanc did not want any trouble but he did not want to end up on the far side of the channel. That could be extremely bad. Meanwhile, the captain of the Emo was like, this ship, it's a weird ship. The propeller is on one side. If I fire it up, I'm going to kind of skew. Um, and did not want to go around the far side. And what ended up happening was the two ships ended up playing chicken um, and whistling, you know, blowing the whistles at each other to go, you get out of the way. No, I'm staying on this course. You get out of the way. The question ended up being who would blink first? And the outcome was the worst possible outcome. They both blinked at the same time. The thing about marine collisions is they tend to happen weirdly slowly. These ships, by the time they actually did bump into each other, they were barely moving relative to each other, but it was enough to crumple the hull of the Mont Blanc knock over some of the barrels and spill some of the benzol. Now, this is not yet a disaster. This was still recoverable. But the, the, the uh, emo then, the first thing it did after, after bumping in was going to reverse, reverse back. You have steel scraping on steel from the two hulls which crumbled into each other. That sparks, that ignites the benzol. From this moment, it was a matter of time. This thing was going to go. Now the question is, what do you do about it? Um, and, and who knows about it? Because what matters at this moment is communication. It's going to happen. Who knows what's on this ship? And here's where a lot of the problem is. The Mont Blanc crew, um, they looked at what was happening. They looked at their fire suppression plan, which was scuttle the ship, and they realized, we don't have time. This thing's going to go up in any minute, and it's going to take like an hour, an hour and a half to actually scuttle the ship. Um, so they abandoned ship. They tried to, to yell at the other crews and warn them of what was going on, um, but they were speaking French. The other crew only spoke English. They didn't understand. 
Um, some of the sailors did hear them yelling on the way past. Some of them didn't because just there was so much noise happening anyway. Um, there were crowds gathered on the harbours either side who were there to watch these ships having a fight because it's always good when this happens. It's always going to be spectacular. And this one was very spectacular. Um, and they didn't know. The crew of the Emo didn't know. The examiner's office actually... A few people there did know. There was um, Lieutenant Commander James Murray, uh, who was in charge there. He, he, uh, he saw what was going on. He knew what was in the ship. He turned around, headed back to, the, um, to his office to try and raise the alarm as fast as he could. He also grabbed another sailor and sent him to the railway dispatch office to get them to, to warn them. The dispatch, dispatch office is like 200 yards from one of the ships. It's just, just here in the, the due south, I think, of, of where the collision happened. Um, that sailor goes and warns Vincent Coleman, who is a train dispatcher on duty. Um, he had some staff there, and he says, oh my God, because he knew what was going to happen next. He said, everyone, run. Um, and they did, and he ran with them. And then he's about 30 seconds to a minute away from the office, and he realizes there's a, there's a train due to arrive in like three or four minutes. So what does he do? He ran back. And he tapped out this message to the next station over. It said, hold up the train, ammunition ship of fire in harbour, making for Pier 6, and will explode. Guess this will be my, my last message. Goodbye, boys. I told you this one gets heavy. It took about 15 minutes um, for the fire to... Um, uh, to ignite the, the explosives, which is honestly longer than people really expected. And the result was, as uh, the minister mentioned this morning, it was actually the largest man-made explosion on the planet until 1945. And we know what happened in 1945. I, um, it's kind of difficult to, uh, to work out how to handle this. The Mont, the Mont Blanc basically vaporized at this point. Um, the shock wave, which is, uh, I, I have learned so much about how explosions work uh, researching this talk. Um, the shock wave is when you have the, the, the gases, they expand um, at great speed. Um, and that would follow the initial explosion. It was so strong that it basically exposed the seabed for, for uh, an instant. 1,600 people died instantly. 9,000 were injured. 6,000 buildings were just destroyed, which means now we have tens of thousands of people homeless in Canada in December. I've been working on this talk um, on and off for around a year. And I thought, you know, let's look at a disaster that is, it's well known in Canada, it's not so well known here. Uh, let's see what, what lessons we can learn. And the more I researched it, I thought, I have bitten off more than I can chew here. How, I mean, this is a technical conference. How do you handle a topic like this and deal with the subject in a way um, that, in all honesty, brings value to those who are here, to, to you listening to this? Um, and that is appropriate to our atmosphere, that isn't just like uh, flippant or it's just going to leave everyone really depressed. So, um, so yeah, I came to Halifax. This is a city with, uh, with, with quite a history. Where I'm standing there is actually the site of the Citadel from, from um, at the top of the hill toward the southern end of, of the map I showed you. And that hill with this hugely well-built building on top of it, which is still standing, had the effect of actually protecting a chunk of the city from the blast. Um, when the explosion happened, most of what was behind, sort of south and west of the citadel was protected. There were some pieces of the ship that flew off in, in uh, oh, I messed up. There were some pieces of the ship that, that flew off in, in different directions. Um, this is one piece. I think it's a part of the anchor. It la landed like three miles from the blast site. That's how powerful this explosion was. So, as I worked through this topic, 
I eventually realized that the important thing for us to look at here is not really the explosion itself, and it's not really so much exactly what led up to it in marine terms. This talk is about blame, which might not be where you expected this to go. What if I told you, having heard what you've heard already, that there was an inquiry and a subsequent trial, and the responsibility for the accident was pinned wholly and entirely on the pilot and crew of the Mont Blanc, the one that came from the south and that was traveling slowly. What do we think of that? This, I have seen this story discussed elsewhere. And at this point, this, this is a bit that kind of gets a bit glossed over. You know, you, you have these like, oh, courts, am I right? Or just an assumption that was all horrendously biased. And it was, but it's really interesting to look at why. Let's, um, let's rewind the tape and look at this again. But instead of looking from overhead, let's look from the point of view of the emo. Because what's interesting here is we kind of need to understand all these things are true of the emo. There were reasons why it was in a hurry. Um, it was still in the harbor because its coal shipment was delayed, because it's a neutral ship, because it kept getting bumped in the queue. And then it got stuck because you can't leave the harbor overnight in wartime. They had submarine nets that come up at around dusk. It was, you know, a neutral ship um, in a hurry to bring relief to Europe. <laughs> Literally had Belgium relief on the side. And then all these delays, which come from being a neutral ship, can compound. So it's behind schedule. It's a ship that tended to skew to port, especially at speed. So when it encountered another ship, and the ship we're about to see coming in is the Clara uh, that was on its way out, rather than trying to go all the way to the right, the captain signaled, no, we're going to keep left. It's, uh, it's my judgment. It's safer that way. And now at this point, the Emo was approaching the Narrows. And as it passed the Clara, with the sun in their eyes, they saw there's another tugboat behind it. This thing was carrying, I haven't rendered it, but there's a bunch of, I think there were coal scutters behind it. So it was like a, a centipede or a snake in the water. Um, the tugboat signaled, I'm gonna pass on the right. Um, but the, oh, I messed up again, I'm so sorry. The tugboat signaled that uh, they're gonna pass on the right, but the captain did not want to risk such a, such a wide turn at that speed. So he signaled again, I'm gonna stay in the channel. Like I said, collisions happen slowly, but your momentum is so high that the time you have to make a decision is very short. So meanwhile, the Mont Blanc, just out of frame, is sailing slowly in the correct lane, but not flying the flag that would indicate explosives aboard. Now, the Mont Blanc really did not want to give way to another ship. It was the last part of an extremely perilous leg. They wanted to take it slow and steady, so the two captains end up playing chicken, they're each trying to do what is safest for the circumstances in which they found themselves. And it would have been okay. But the emo made a last second decision to go hard to stern. It looked like they passed each other by centimeters. But the emo made a, a last, second, last second decision to go hard to stern, fired up the propeller, which skewed the boat, and they bumped into each other. And then not only that, but the crew of the Mont Blanc abandoned ship and ran. When you look at it like that, can I get a show of hands? Who thinks the emo is still to blame? No, three, a few, a, a small few. Who thinks the Mont Blanc is now to blame? Yeah, still not many. And can I get, just to make sure people are still awake, who thinks it's kind of shared? Yeah, it's kind of shared. Um, my take is it's the emo's fault. I mean, come on. <laughs> they were speeding in the wrong lane. <laughs> um, but there were multiple proceedings which followed this. First, there was the inquiry to find out the facts. And then there was a, a criminal trial. And in principle, this sounds like a solid process, right? You have a judge. You have all the parties represented. You have the companies that owned two ships were there. They qualified counsel. The pilot of the Mont Blanc survived. So he was there. The pilots, by the way, work for the harbor, not for the ships. 
in a, in a constricted space like a harbour or like the Panama Canal, um, you're still captain of your ship, but a pilot who knows the lay of the land, if you like, uh, comes on board and is, is giving the direct instructions. Francis Mackey was this guy's name, uh, and he worked for the port, and he, he came and testified uh, voluntarily. He wasn't summoned. Um, he didn't have his own lawyer. He just wanted to help the inquiry. And that's actually where the problems really begin, because the ship owners were desperate to avoid blame, because blame means money. And the lawyer for the owners of the emo behaved absolutely abominably in court. He had it in for Francis Mackey. He accused him of being a drunk, which was completely made up, by the way. He accused him of perjuring himself while the bells tolled for the dead. This is the kind of stuff that was happening. The judge should have put a stop to this. He didn't. And um, there were a couple of reasons for that, but two things really weighed very significantly against the crew of the Mont Blanc in this process. One is that they were still alive. And that makes it it's easier to have sympathy with those who, who died than those who are still living, right? The tabloids made sure of that. And the other, there's really no, way, no good way to, to put this. They were French. <laughs> the 1910s was a wild time for racism, my friends. Um, there was serious tension at the time between um, English Canadians and French Canadians. The US, this is the 1910s, was talking about annexing Canada. This was a thing. And then the, the big problem is, all this obscured the facts. It's fair to say that this made it harder to discern the underlying facts of what happened. Normally, when this goes to appeal, um, appeals courts, the Supreme Court of Canada in this case, isn't allowed to go and re revisit the facts. They're supposed to have been established already. But in this case, it was, it was so egregious, the, the whole process, that they went to, to significant legal lengths uh, to, to review the facts. Um, eventually went to the Law Lords in London, uh, the way the, the legal system worked at the time, and they eventually affirmed the Supreme Court's decision to assign shared blame. So legally, almost everyone in this room is right and I'm wrong. But what I think is really interesting about this is seeking to assign blame too quickly distorts the process of learning lessons. And we never mean to do that but it can be very hard to resist that. The problem is there's no shortcut for the process of learning lessons. I like to try and look at this through the lens of, um, you know, we all know the techniques we're supposed to use in studying incidents. What was the root cause in this case? Was it the speeding? Was it the explosives? Was it the lack of communications? Was it the submarine nets? I mean, these are all contributing factors. They all matter in, in understanding what happened. Um, Let's take another approach. Let's look at five whys. You know five whys, you keep asking why until you get to the, the root of what you're doing. Um, why did the ships collide? Because the Mont Blanc wasn't flying the red flag. Why wasn't it flying the red flag? Well, because they didn't want to announce that they were carrying explosives. Why didn't they want to announce that? Because they were in the middle of World War I. Um, why were they in the middle of World War I? Because Gavrilo Princip shot the Archduke Ferdinand and precipitated a series of declarations of war. They weren't getting nowhere with this. What I'm really getting at here is, look, there's no shortcut to learning lessons from, from any incident. Even the full weight of an adversarial judicial process got the wrong answer here. Whoever is leading the process needs to be patient, clueful, and have enough domain knowledge to know when they're being fed a line. One more thing about Halifax is just a, a, a thing about how the, the, the border is, is traced in that part of the world. It's the closest city to Halifax is in the United States. So the city that first got word that this had happened and was the first to drop everything and send aid was Boston. This was crucial in saving even more lives because not only were there thousands of wounded and tens of thousands of people homeless, but the next few days, they could not catch a break. There were snow blizzards the next few days with so many people homeless. It was a dire situation. And the city of Boston, like I said, just dropped everything to send help. Over the following years, the US and Canada grew closer 
talk of annexing kind of just petered out. It became a bit embarrassing. And every year since then, for the last 105 years now, Halifax sends a Christmas tree to Boston to say thank you. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Anna. That was really fascinating talk. Uh, I think we've learned a lot there. Um, a very tragic piece of history that relates to today. Um, have we any questions? Nothing so far on Slido, but any questions from the audience? Which I can barely see. No. You can have, you can have a think. Are, are, are there some parallels in modern history, Anna? It just strikes me that, I mean, there was a recent tragic explosion, I think it was two years ago, in, um, in Beirut. Yeah. Which seems frighteningly similar, you know, a hundred years later. Yeah, that's, that's uh, um, it's hard to know how to compare these, right? Um, that was in some ways a different situation, and in some ways it was also like you could see that if this wasn't, um, uh, there were ways to manage uh, this situation in advance that could have prevented it. Um, but uh, other than that, I think it's, it, it's very tough to compare. You, um, we always want, when we're um, uh, after the fact, we want to look at these things and go, oh my God, we should have done all these things. And I think as, as for our own sector, we, we are in I mean, certainly a much better position than we were when I started 20, 25 years ago. Um, we have a lot more processes in place and we have used them and we have tried them out. Um, but you do still have incidents. And when you're trying to, to follow up on them, particularly in such a charged situation like this, or like in the, the explosion in Beirut, um, there's a lot of people suddenly with a lot of different interests interacting and trying to steer things. So incident response and um, follow-up is really hard. And it's one of those things where we try and look at it in the abstract and go, there are things we should do on this process that we should follow. But it takes domain expertise to know, hang on a minute, you're, uh, you're saying things, but, and they sound reasonable because they're reasonable words, but it's not. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, I think we will finish there. And uh, can I just ask you to show your appreciation to Anna for such a fascinating talk? Thank you, Anna. And you may want to move uh, to the Parallel B session, or you may be staying here, so feel free to move. And if I could just ask the next speakers to make your way to the stage, and we'll start as soon as possible. Thank you. Okay, oh, we're already turned on, okay. So thank you for your patience, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So I'd like to introduce the second talk now this morning from the Parallel B session. And this is again, um, another fascinating talk from uh, the guys here. We have Keith Manson from the Marine Institute and we have Ronan Murphy from Agile. And they're gonna talk about the RV Tom Crean, the research vessel and exploring the legacy of the, um, the RV Tom Crean. And, really a pioneering maritime vessel and what they've been working on and uh, learn a little bit about conservation in the modern area. So I'd like to welcome the, the two guys. Sorry. Uh, apologies, I forgot to mention Keith Manson from Juniper. Apologies. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Keith Manson. I'm the IT Systems and Operations Manager uh, for the Marine Institute. And today I'm going to take you through some of the national research infrastructure uh, that's in place to acquire, process, disseminate uh, large environmental da data sets that we work with uh, in order to harness our ocean wealth. 
I'll also give you an overview of uh, the RV Tom Crane, a state-of-the-art research vessel uh, commissioned in June of last year. Uh, I'll discuss some of the challenges and opportunities uh, in commissioning the, the vessel ICT infrastructure, a project that was shortlisted uh, for the 2023 Tech Excellence Awards. So the Marine Institute is a, a state agency responsible for marine research, technology development and innovation in Ireland. We have quite a wide remit, um, a total of seven service groups. Um, take a, a couple of examples, our Fisheries Ecosystems Advisory Services. They assess and advise on the sustainable development of, of the marine uh, fisheries resources in the waters around Ireland. Um, so for instance, they produce a stock book every year that basically t says how many fish are in the Irish Sea. Um, our marine environment and food safety services uh, provide scientific advice and a range of, uh, uh, of services to, to uh, monitor uh, the environment uh, including, you know, monitoring programs such, uh, to support the, the aquaculture industry and the seafood industry. The IT function itself sits in ocean climates and, and information services, and we provide both national and international marine monitoring uh, and R&D projects, as well as the, uh, the IT infrastructure and information management systems used by the company as a whole. Our policy and in, uh, innovation and research services, they work uh, closely with the research community and the education sector to stimulate and, and maximise uh, Ireland's participation in international and national programmes to do with marine research. The whole research and, uh, and innovation side is central uh, to the role of the Marine Institute, both as a research performer and as a research funder. Uh, we have a high reliance on ICD infrastructure to collect, process, analyse, store, and then subsequently disseminate uh, large volumes of data to, to, to the relevant stakeholders. So, where do we get this data from? Uh, essentially, you can get it from four main areas. The first is our in situ national research infrastructure, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But we also have scientists going out in the field, taking samples, bringing them back to our laboratories, processing, and then uh, providing advice and reports to industry uh, from those samples. We have remote sensing in place. Then, uh, an example would be the Irish Tide Gauge Network, which prov provides an early warning system uh, for coastal flooding, something that is very prevalent at the minute. Um, we have weather boys out in the ocean providing data back to Met Aaron uh, in order to, to, to give us our weather forecasts. And we also do quite a bit of modelling uh, using high performance computing um, in a number of different fields, uh, including search and recovery. So we would provide data to the Coast Guard and, and, and the like. We also do quite a bit of uh, seabed mapping and habitat monitoring. So two examples of that would be our Infomar program, which we run in conjunction with the Geological Survey Ireland. And that produces three dimensional maps of the seabed. Um, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. We also have our Nephrops underwater TV program, which provides footage of prawn burrows, um, which is critical to the sustainability of the, the Nephro Nephrops fishing industry. Um, and it, which is valued at around 55 million to the Irish economy on an annual basis. So, uh, the whole reason for collecting all of this data uh, is to aid decision making on the sustainable use of marine resources. Uh, we have a strategic priority to be a leader in, in Europe's digital transformation through the development of an interactive digital mod model of the ocean, a digital twin, if you like, of Ireland's uh, oceans. And that provides insight to aid decision-making, 
um, and advance our knowledge of the oceans and um, in, in turn improve the services that we give to our stakeholders. We embrace technologies such as high-end computing, cloud services. We work you know, for digital collaboration and workflows with our, our project partners. We use quite a bit of data analytics and, and artificial intelligence. That obviously requires digital skills within the organization. It requires data connectivity to a lot of these remote sensors that are out there in the field. And it all has to be underpinned by cybersecurity. We all know that uh, these days, cybersecurity is an absolute must. So we have a bucket load of IoT devices um, from data buoys to underwater sensors to gliders. We even have a network sitting in 22 meters of water uh, on the ocean floor a couple of kilometers off the coast of Spittle. Um, and that provides a, a test bed for industry. If they want to come along with a, uh, a device and field test it, we can physically plug their device in and give them real-time data and power uh, on how, how their, uh, their device is, is performing. We also have uh, a couple of other pieces of, of fairly large equipment. Um, we, we have the Celtic Explorer, which is a, uh, our larger vessel. Um, it uh, accommodates 18 scientists and 13 crew, can go out for 35 days at a time. We have a remotely underwater uh, operated uh, vehicle, which uh, essentially can travel down to uh, 3,000 meters. It has a number of cameras attached to it. It has arms on it that we can physically take samples from the seabed and below. We did have the Celtic Voyager, um, but just recently that has been replaced by the Tom Green, which is our new state-of-the-art uh, vessel. So this is the Tom Green, Ireland's new state-of-the-art multi-purpose marine vessel. It was designed by uh, a Nor Norwegian ship company um, and built by the Spanish shipyard in Vigo. Uh, the build began in July 2019 and it was delivered to Galway in uh, July of last year. It's used by the Marine Institute and other state bodies and universities to undertake fishery surveys, oceanographic and environmental research, seabed mapping surveys, as well as maintaining and deploying weather buoys, observational infrastructure, and remotely operated vehicles. The vessel will enable 300 operational days at sea each year, uh, with up to 3,000 scientist days uh, per annum. She's equipped for 21 days at sea, uh, and is designed to, to operate in, in harsh sea conditions. So the minister mentioned Tom Crean this morning. Um, so. We named the vessel after Tom Crean, who was a renowned Irish seaman and uh, explorer, uh, originally from Kerry, a proud Kerry man. Um, Tom Crean undertook three Antarctic vessel, uh, uh, Antarctic expeditions, um, the last of which was on the Endurance, uh, which got stuck in pack ice and was drifting for 492 days before she eventually broke up. Uh, the crew launched the lifeboats and they managed to make it to Elephant Island. From there, uh, there was an extraordinary feat of seamanship and navigation, um, probably the, the, the most recorded uh, in history, where they took 17 days through gales and snow squalls to make it across uh, to, to South Georgia Island. From there, Shackleton, Keane and Worsley had to trek across the island to go to the, whale, to, to the nearest whaling station to, to raise the alarm and get help. Um, they had no equipment, no maps. They even took nails from the lifeboats, stuck them onto their shoes to act as crampons. Um, it was an extraordinary feat. Um, eventually, they made it there. They raised the alarm. Uh, 
And it took a further three months and four failed attempts to rescue uh, the other 22 crewmen that were left on, uh, on Elephant Island. And for that, uh, Keane uh, uh, won the Albert Medal for Life Saving, which later became the George Cross. So our vessels, uh, some of the challenges that we have in, in terms of, of cutting out a vessel, obviously it operates in harsh environments, maybe not as harsh as Tom Crean experienced, but there's a lot of pitch and roll. Um, so we, you know, we're affected by wind and swell, which can sometimes be violent. You know, the, the, the hull can slam down on, on uh, waves and the like. Uh, and as a result, any mechanical movement parts, such as robotic tape libraries and the like, are a disaster. Solid state drives have been a godsend for us. We have a very high reliance on ICT infrastructure to operate the, the vessel effectively. We have KVM uh, uh, screens uh, all over the, the vessel providing real-time data to, uh, to the crew and to the scientists. We have phone systems for ship's communications. We have VMs running data acquisition software. We have data storage. Obviously, it's very expensive to, to acquire this data. So therefore, we want to make sure that, uh, that everything works as it should do. So resilience and redundancy are absolutely key for us. We need to carry spares. Uh, we need easy replacement uh, and configuration when things need to be swapped out. The, the number of spots on the, uh, uh, on the vessel are, are, are limited. So the crew tend to be ship's technicians as opposed to IT technicians. So as a result, we have to support it remotely, often over very slow satellite connections. Uh, and, and that connectivity is one of our biggest challenges. So it was somewhat the same in terms of the commissioning of the vessel. Uh, it was done offshore. It was done in Vigo uh, in, in Spain. And we had very, very tight timelines in order to, to deploy. Um, all of the equipment we staged in Ireland uh, with Agile Networks doing uh, the, the switching side of things and the Marine Institute and p and Maritime Services who crew the vessels, pretty much doing everything else. Uh, we shipped everything out in a container uh, and then flew staff out to deploy uh, and, and test it. We had a four-day window to install the networking side of things, and then a further five days to install absolutely everything else. We had to work to strict uh, timelines. We only had power on the vessel between eight and five, and that was down to insurance reasons. They couldn't have shore-based power overnight. So as a result, we had to make sure everything was shut down uh, before 5, 5 p.m. There was lots of activity, you know, trades people pushing and, uh, to complete the vessel uh, in time. So we had to work around, you know, painters and electricians, and we had a few delays on fiber cables and the like. Uh, so it was certainly a busy time. But thankfully, the vessel left Vigo on time and arrived in Galway on the 18th of July, uh, 22. We then had four days where the vessel was going out on sea trials. So we had to continue to fine tune during that time uh, before its departure for the, first, uh, for the first full survey. Thankfully, that first survey was a resounding success. Um, we had no ICT issues. There was a couple of issues with, with fishing nets and the like, but thankfully that wasn't our, uh, our concern. In terms of the ICT infrastructure itself, um, we put in uh, dual power edge Dell uh, hypervisors connected to a clustered shared volume um, from a Dell power, power vault storage array. We had dual LTO9 tape drives connected to each hypervisor to give us that resilience should it, one of the hypervisors fall over. We deployed seven Juniper uh, switching stacks uh, which were connected to two cores uh, with redundant fiber, providing over 650 ports, uh, most of which have been consumed by this stage uh, with ship's instruments and, and uh, PCs and the like. 
We had a network, a Wi-Fi network throughout the vessel, which is no mean feat in a big metal box. Uh, we had VOIP phones system. As I mentioned, we have a KVM, uh, which provides 42 high-res mo monitors, uh, which displays real-time data to, to the scientists. Uh, we deployed a dark trace security appliance, something we use on our shore-based operations as well. Albeit uh, on the shore, we use the cloud version. Uh, on the vessels, because of connectivity, we use a local appliance, which then updates to the cloud when we come back into port and we get that 4G connection. Got to give a shout out to, to both the Agile engineers um, and also the Marine Institute engineers uh, that, uh, that managed to complete the project. We were nominated and shortlisted for the, the Tech Excellence Awards. Um, uh, that was in the category of Public Sector IT Project of the Year. Um, unfortunately, we were just pipped to the post by on post, but uh, you never know, we might have another go when we go to replace the Explorer. Um, I also need to give a shout out to the brokerage team in the HEA net. This equipment that, that, that we procured for the vessel was all purchased through brokered agreements from the HEA net. And the value that we get from those uh, and the amount of headache it takes away in procurement, uh, it, it really does uh, help us out significantly. So in the first year, we, the, the Tom Crean traveled an impressive uh, over 32,000 nautical miles. That's the equivalent of circling Ireland 46 times. We had 20 surveys completed, over 296 days at sea. We accommodated 177 scientists and provided 236 students with a new, unique learning experience as part of their course. We completed five Infomar surveys, uh, mapping over 6,000 square kilometers. Uh, and, and that data gives us a fascinating insight into Irish territorial waters. Historically, we've known more about the moon surface than we have about our own ocean floor. And that's now changing as a result of Infomar. You know, nautical maps really are, they're based on 200 year old methods of making those maps. Infomar are now building three dimensional maps based on 21st century technology. We produce a number of, of products uh, from the data that we collect. You know, everything from depth to geophysical work and sampling, um, such as seabed and sediment data. We even look at what's below that, that seabed, uh, which can be uh, invaluable data when you, you look at laying, you know, uh, pipelines and the like. It's obviously very expensive to do this sort of mapping. But cost-benefit analysis has shown that uh, the seabed mapping in general provides a return on investment about four to six times the cost. Um, and it, it, it enhances our understanding of the Earth's oceans, our seas, um, uh, and the Earth's coasts, and how it's all globally connected together. There's multiple uses, as I say, um, in, in management of Ireland's marine resource, for instance, in fisheries, in harbour management, in pipeline laying, and, and a big thing at the minute, obviously, offshore energy. Um, the list goes on and on. In terms of NEFROPS, uh, underwater TV surveys, we, uh, we managed to, uh, to cover off 539 stations or, you know, areas, uh, showing prawn burrows um, around the Irish territorial waters, and that equated to about 133 kilometers of, of film seabed. And importantly, zero ICT failures. And that has continued to, have, uh, to be the case ever since. So what next? As I mentioned, one of the biggest challenges for us is in connectivity. Cloud services has become embedded in both work and our personal lives. You know, if you think as an IT manager or, or someone involved in IT, could you, you 
run your networks without the cloud these days? It's difficult to do because everything is geared towards cloud. But on the vessels, we don't have that, that uh, connectivity to allow it. If you look at the, the uh, you know, whether it be an M365 in security monitoring, Defender, Dark Race, or whatever, but also if you think about the crew themselves that are spending a large portion of their life on the vessel, you know, they can't get social media, they can't easily communicate with their families, they can't even bank anymore, uh, they can't bank online. So, Elon, to the, to the rescue. Um, so we, we've now deployed Starlink on both of our uh, research vessels, and that's taken our connectivity from one meg to 280 megs per second, which is a game changer for us. We don't have the latency issues, we don't have the reliability issues uh, of satellite, um, and it's a, for a seventh of the cost uh, of running satellite. And that opens up a huge number of opportunities for us. You know, both in terms of maintenance and development, we no longer have to wait until the vessel comes back into port to look at downloading patches and deploying them across the network. We get the real-time data coming from, uh, uh, from the ship, and we can start to use some of these cloud services, whether it be in uh, M365 security and compliance, or whether it be in, in, in dark trace or whatever. And also, a big one for us now is uh, the ability to deploy MIST, uh, Juniper MIST, which is something that we, we use in our shore-based operations um, and has given us significant improvements in network management. So now we're looking to bring it to the, the research vessels. It uses a combination of AI, machine learning, and data science techniques to optimize network efficiency, simplifies up, uh, operations, and provides us with full visibility of, of each connected device in a single pane of glass. So that, that's pretty much all there is from me, uh, and I'll hand you over to, uh, to Ronan now uh, from Juniper to talk a little bit about MIST. Thanks, Keith. Keith. Um, so, Ronan McCarthy, um, I'm standing in for Sean Nolan because Sean is down with COVID, right? So, Sean from Agile has asked, and I got the hospital pass on the way down yesterday, right? So, uh, Sean has 708 slides, and I have to get through them in about four seconds. Um, yeah, I'm not sure someone can get the slide deck up if that's okay, and we can get going. Listen, Ronan McCarthy, I'm looking after Juniper Networks here in Ireland, working with Kevin Gannon, our senior systems engineer. Um, Juniper Network, I joined Juniper Networks in January this year after 20 odd years working as a Cisco network engineer, network architect, and have I done something? And a consultant. Um, hmm? They're on the bottom of the last ones. Oh, well then we'll, we'll, we'll wing it. It'll be grand. Yeah, <laughs> there's no panic. Yeah. So, um, George mentioned artificial intelligence and the number of times artificial intelligence will be mentioned at the, at the, at the, at the, at the conference here this week. Um, it's really, really interesting that George also mentioned about data and the importance of data and machine learning to artificial intelligence. At Juniper Networks, we've been collecting petabytes of data every day from our enterprise networking and actually putting that in and, and overlaying our, our, our uh, machine learning and our modeling across that to provide better outcomes and be able to provide a conversational interface that Kevin Gannon can talk about much better than I can. It's really, really interesting and it's quite elegant to be here in Kerry, um, which is actually the birthplace of artificial intelligence. A guy called John McCarthy, whose home, whose home base is just 30 minutes down the road, in 1956 at the summer school in Dartmoor University, first coined the phrase artificial intelligence. So Kerry's given us really good All-Ireland football finals and artificial intelligence and an amazing landscape and a great venue. But the important part of what we're doing every day is being able to actually look at how a service level experience, we take 150 metrics per minute 
per connected device on the wireless network. And we're actually using that wired and wireless network, and we're using that to provide a much better outcome. We're using machine learning. We have a conversational interface that can integrate into Teams. As Keith said, you know, everybody in the room here has a distributed campus. You know, sometimes large campuses, sometimes crossing county boundaries. Keith's distributed campus is 200 nautical miles out into the sea, right? It's a much, much different proposition. So we're actually being able to have the ability with our MIST platform to reduce trouble tickets by 96%, to reduce um, escalations, reduce network deployment time by 86%, and reduce uh, escalations and a 10x reduction in escalations. We're able to do that by using our data science, our data modeling, and our machine learning across our MIST platform. Kevin is going to talk a little bit now around how our wired assurance and what we're actually doing from that perspective and doesn't have the slides to support him, so I'll let you out of Kevin, right? <laughs> Thanks. So I guess I'll start this conversation with an anecdote. It's 24 years since I met Anna Wilson out in UCD when HENet was based out there and we had a, an unusual uh, challenge at the time. The entire connectivity for the internet for all the colleges was two megabits per second. And it was uh, Anna and Mike Norris who had, you know, had this debate or argument with myself and one of my colleagues at the time. They needed to share that bandwidth equally. And I, that's easy. You divide the colleges by, you know, 10 colleges, they all get, you know, 10 by 2 megs. No, no, that wasn't, that's a, as Mike described at the time, that's a service provider's attitude. That's the SLA that you want to give. Now, SLAs haven't changed much. You know, 0% packet loss or it's, you know, 99.999% uptime. That's a, a very easy thing to do, or at least a very easy thing to measure. But Mike's point was that may be the, the very clinical and scientific, but the expectation from the universities was quite simple. If UCD were quiet at a particular time, why should, you know, Dundalk or UCC or any of the other colleges not benefit from their lack of usage, right? But at any particular time, you know, if everyone decides to be busy, they would all get their fair share, right? So the purpose of this anecdote is SLAs are an old-fashioned thing, right? They're, they're usually enforced for monetary reasons, and that's the only reason. Expectation. That is the one thing that has changed radically. Two megabits per second on your phone here in a, you know, a mostly concrete metal room, you'd be disappointed with, right? That's really where AI is coming in. It's not, and I'm the most cynical person in this room, the, the only reason I joined Juniper was the people who were actually using this technology, right? And it's not because of their scale, it's because of their particular unique situation. I've MIT, Dartmouth, um, Amazon, Google, they are all pioneers in the day-to-day -day AI that you use. And the, the interface, that we use, you know, I'm accustomed to CLI, some people are accustomed to web, but if you look at my children, they want to talk to the device in English, or their version of English at least. So what MIST brings to us is quite simply, we take in a lot of data, from that data we learn things, and we have a thing called a service level expectation, what your users would expect. And a simple word is, I want to connect quickly, I want to get service, and I want it to be always the same. In other words, if it takes me two minutes to log in in the morning, I want it to always be two minutes. If it's one minute, 30, I'm upset, et cetera. And what MIST brings is when there's an aberration or you know, an expectation isn't being met, it's the why. We're only interested in what's wrong. And uh, the, the exposure of that is I can actually ask the system. I can type in a question and say, what is wrong with my team's call? And it will actually give me the answer in English. It'll say, okay, some of it, isn't for the general public, but it'll say, there's latency on this link, or there's latency, but it's only for Ronan's call at this moment in time, and everyone else is unaffected. Now, trying to do that with traditional network management, even in real time, is impossible, but to be able to ask the question, what happened yesterday, that is really what AI brings to the picture. It's the, what's in our heads? It's a data scientist's approach to all the data. The data scientists that we employ don't know anything about networking. We measure things that give a good experience and when they deviate, we figure out how it is and then we can learn from others. You know, if I've got a customer with a million access points or a million switches, they learn things quicker than someone with two. But all that data is given to the benefit of everyone. 
And really, the AI allows us to free up our time to do more interesting things. Right? Um, not only do we expose it, I mean, we even have a Teams plugin. You can give it to your customers, your end users, and they can ask, what is wrong with my Teams call? And it will give you an answer that is as clear as humanly possible. That is just simply not possible with any other technology in use today. And while AI is very important, the people who are doing computer science today learn about AI. There's a very small number of people who come up with the, let's call it the, the advanced portion of AI, the new algorithms, the, the new models, etc. But it's very consumable now. And it's putting this into the hands of network engineers without having to become data scientists. And data is key. The more data you have, my nine-year-olds and 12-year-olds kids are equally intelligent, depending on the day that's in it. However, the experience they have, the more data you have, the more learning you have, that's what's key. So when Ronan said we take in petabytes of data, it really is petabytes of data every day. And it's not, uh, not fair to say that everyone's network is the same, right? So some people will learn, you know, if you have a million devices, and it's 0.0001% failure rate for hardware. We learn from that and can predictively, in advance, tell you when things are going to fail. You know, I'm at this 25 years. Everyone has been talking about a single pane of glass and predicting when faults will occur. Now it is a reality. Hardware and software is becoming much more complicated. You know, if I told Mike Norris and Anna when I met them first that I'd be able to get 500 megabits per second on a device sitting in this room to the internet, I think they would have fallen on the ground laughing at me. But that is the reality, and to be able to do that is extremely complicated. Right? And I'm not sure that anyone in this room, you know, if we took two megabits to the 10 gig that many of you are connected at, if, you, if your amount of staff you had increased at that rate, I think we'd be uh, very happy. We've less people, more demands on us, and really AI is the answer to that. It makes our life easier. And I think thank we want to leave there. So thank you very much. Uh, we've run a little bit over time, so apologies. Can I ask you to show your appreciation for the three guys from Keith and Kevin and Ronan? Thanks very much. Ronan, I'm uh, working in the Research and Infrastructure and Testbed Division in Walton Institute in Southeast Technological University, Waterford Campus. Uh, this is a story. Um, uh, some, it's a horror story. Uh, my colleagues, it's a horror story. For Anna, it could be, a, a, I suppose, a learning story. What the messes can we learn from it? But all good stories start in a nice location. In this case, it was actually, I was in Castletown Bear when this happened. I was on a ferry across to, um, to uh, Bear Island to do work. And I missed a phone call, um, which I didn't see because it's quite noisy on the ferries. I don't know if you know Murphy's Ferries. And uh, I missed one call. And as I was taking a picture, uh, I saw that I'd missed a call, and the phone started to ring again, and it was my colleague, Michael. Now, Michael never rings me. Um, he, he never, ever rings me. So I answer the phone, and he says to me, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, John, we're in the sheets. How fast can you get back here? And my answer to him was not satisfactory from his point of view. It was five hours approximately, because uh, getting to Waterford takes, uh, from Castellanbert takes that length of time. So, uh, 176 minutes without power, data center nightmare. Um, here we go, give you some background. I've given this talk before, actually part of it, last HA in our conference, and I have quite a few slides, so I'm gonna rattle through them quite quickly, um, and I'll take questions over coffee later, or maybe something stronger. Um, background is, we have a small DC, 27, 26 cabs, everything from 6 to 30 kilowatts with high density row, low density row, water cooled, dual 500 kilowatt chillers, and we have 900 kV generator and two 300 kilowatt UPSs at the back. Um, in general, at the moment, we need about 150 to 200 kilowatts of cooling continuously, depending on the day and the temperature. So, um, November 25th, like I said, I was halfway across to uh, Bear Island. Uh, the guys were in the office, because of COVID, we, we had split the shifts. Um, in that we had, um, we tried to have two people in the office and two out of the office in case uh, one group got COVID, um, so we could stay maintaining uh, the services because we, we host iChecks uh, K in the place. So Guy arrived on site, um, and we'll come back to um, Anna's um, reasons why later on, but 
one of the reasons that this happened was, that was poor communication. Anyway, contractor requested a chiller changeover. He left it too long to let everybody know there was a problem. Um, by the time the alarm started going off, um, the guys was, they were, they were distracted with something else going on in the office. Internal breaker went in the building. At that point, uh, battery string failed on one UPS. Uh, about five minutes later, second battery string blew, and that was it, game over. 35 minutes, start to finish. That's, that's um, how long it took to happen. Uh, contractor had never been to the site before. He was given a radio, he was given instructions, and left to operate on his own, but he never told anyone what he was doing. Um, so the interesting thing, because we'll come back to it, that gap there, you can see we've gone over the red line, um, but basically, 600 is the internal break of the building, and you can see we're gone above the 600 there. I mean, that's important, we'll come back to later on. But the last values are 629 amps, 616, and 603. The breaker is set for 600. Um, and we built this dashboard ourselves. Uh, we, we didn't have it before then. Um, so yeah, the interesting thing here, and this is what confused me initially, the system's actually recovering when the power went, when the power trip to Everton went. And that was really confusing for a long time until we went back and looked at it. And you can see over there the, the two chillers swapped over and there's a fairly long gap um, between one and the next one. It's an active standby system. Generally, one drops off, the other will come in immediately. Um, but yeah, temperatures were coming down, the system was recovering, and the power still went. We still went through, through, the, through the maximum load. And that was confusing. So yeah, contributor factors. We've grown, grown used to working near the limits of the system. Too many distractions in the office at the time. There was actually failed sensors we, we, um, we didn't know about. And there was actually unexplained load, which we figured out afterwards where it came from, that we weren't metering, we didn't know about. Um, so approximately 40 amps a phase, uh, or about, about 40 amps uh, of a load isn't metered in the building, which we found subsequently, which is actually just what it was enough to show us over the threshold. Um, it's actually due to the, the it's, the heating systems in the building is actually what, what generates that load. So there's the rough um, timeline uh, to get the power back. Um, interesting thing there was we actually had, a, we, we knew we were in trouble. Um, I got back about five o'clock and they were just getting some of the core services back online. Um, there was, um, we had a, a temporary UPS rolling from the UK that evening with China and Powers Assistance, because um, what we found out that we didn't know is as far as the insurance company was concerned, if the equipment isn't running on UPS, it's not insured. We didn't actually know that before then, um, so it was made quite clear that we needed to get a UPS um, of some sort back operational. So fire brigade was in, all sorts of chaos. Um, basically, the smell that the contractor had gone back up to the roof and he, as he was going up the stairs, he could get a funny smell, which was the batteries had blown and had puked all over the, uh, um, the room upstairs. Um, wasn't pleasant, so once they cleared it, um, I forgot to plug in the audio, actually. Um, where's that audio lead? Um, there's two videos there. They're showing the data center um, without power. And the really thing is, is, weird thing is, it's so quiet. I'll just play that one again. This is the supercomputer when it's off. So that's K data. Very silent in here. We just had a power cut, and I check stopped the supercomputer. That's the network and room. And the network room went as well. Emergency lighting was still working There's at this no point. no power to the entire um, system. But that runs network. out after a while too, so it no becomes a health and safety center, issue no as well. Pooling, nothing. Anyway, that was it. So following morning, November 26th, I had made a lot, I was, on the, I was coming back from Castleton Bear. Uh, guy with me, Hugh, I had him ringing people. I was ringing people. Every small UPS I could get my hands on, I begged, borrowed and stole what I could. Um, so we'd get some stuff running back the following day. We still had power in the building, and once it was restored, just the UPSs were dead. Uh, so there was no filtering at all in the incoming mains. Got some management services back up, email server, uh, 
didn't come back up, had to be rebuilt, started in an internal power order because we knew then immediately we were going to have to transition onto temporary power for any recovery work. So the first thing was, is what we know still correct as regard what's plugged in where? It never is, um, but look, that's, that's the reality of it. So that was, um, that was that. We all took the weekend off. Um, we had a temporary UPS on the way. It was a small 10-foot container. Um, we knew we needed a generator for temporary power because the build, building generator isn't designed. The internal breaker had gone. The UPSs were after that. Um, so we couldn't run the building on the big generator because a lot of the stuff was gone. And to do any, any movement, uh, our repairs in the building required to power off the building, which meant we had to have independent power to run whatever, of course, um, core things we needed to run. So got all the small UPSs racked, migrated the generator to test it, all the, all the power leads that need to be labelled and verify that they were correct because, unfortunately, we did lose services for some of our some clients a couple of times. The uh, big one was my fault, uh, but it's, uh, we're trying to make sure we don't drop, don't drop stuff that we don't want to, want to lose. So there is 60 kVA of electrical goodness. Um, it's uh, Clem Jacob dropped it into us. Now, the other issue was when this happened, it's just coming into late November, early December in Waterford. Winterville is on. Every generator, every power lead is basically sought after in Waterford because of all the stands, all the trade stands done around Waterford City. So I rang Joe and Clem. I said, Joe, give me every cable you have. I'll give you back what I don't need, but whatever you have in the stores, bring them because we don't know what we need. We didn't know what we needed. Um, so he literally turned up a couple of units. And uh, one thing I learned is those 64 amp uh, our 63 amp uh, three-phase cables are heavy. They are really heavy. I never worked in uh, rigging for stages and that, but yeah, those guys do get a workout when they move stuff around. Um, so yeah, basically you can see there's 64 amp or 63 amp distribution box in the ground, powering all the uh, network equipment off of that. Uh, we had to figure out what we had to move, do a test, uh, move, move equipment across onto it, check that we were loading the phases in the generator fairly evenly, um, so yeah, we threw with that box, with another box in the DC, as you can see, health and safety nightmare, but uh, basically what servers we needed to power up, power them up directly, power some UPSs directly, move machines onto those UPSs where we could, especially the core services, multiple 32 amp cables going around the floor, um, yeah, lots and lots of cables. So yeah, the rest of the week then, um, of course, there was no heating in the office because it was geothermal. That was all dead. The, the office got progressively cooler. The doors were open most of the time. So we had to figure out what was gone. Some, some hardware didn't come back. Uh, what services did we need to bring back up for Walton people, Walton staff to use? The uh, biggest one was GitLab. Once we had that back up, most people were quite happy because they could work away. Um, we lost um, multiple dead hard drives. It's a long tail. There's still drives failing uh, out of it. Uh, core switch just didn't come back, server didn't come back, Had backups, restore those from backups, build new machines. Um, network management tools, you forget how dependent upon them you become when they're not there. It's like, how do we do that again? Where do we log into it? Uh, those things happen. Um, yeah, in, uh, ironically, ironically, there was some fire warden training mandatory we had to attend in the middle of it. Um, and we're like, well, we've just had a fire, we, we don't need the training, we, 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 we evacuated, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, and then weekends, because we weren't there, we were shutting everything down the weekend, just basically, uh, in case we weren't there and something else happened. Uh, so we're literally, it was to protect against more sudden power loss events, because we still didn't have a, a, a proper UPS in place. Um, so yeah, Storm Barra happened that week, um, which meant the ferries were all delayed. Um, just about two hours before the, the truck arrived with the temporary UPS, um, we had measured 112 kilometers an hour on the roof of the building. So it wasn't pleasant, it was a red warning, the campus was closed, had to have a, arguments to get stuff brought in, get stuff left in, but we got it in anyway. Um, the next problem was getting it into place. Um, we had to find a generator, or not a generator, a crane, uh, and a big crane. Um, th there was basically, a, it had to be lifted into a certain location. Uh, it was, we, we were asked to lift it to a certain location, and you had to get a 100-ton crane to do that, and they don't, they don't, they're not, you don't just go to your local hire company and get a 100-ton crane. Um, so yeah, got our open stack up, 
migrated the GitLab to a new cloud. We've just been deploying a new OpenStack. We, run, we run, have run in the past multiple OpenStack uh, instances. We're down to two, three now. Um, so we've always a test one. Um, so basically, we've done on-premises cloud. We were able to migrate a lot of our current cloud, which is distributed over 10 compute nodes, a bunch of storage nodes. We had just started commissioning a new cloud, which was two or three nodes, which would run on one UPS, effectively, one small 5 kV UPS. And we were able to migrate a lot of things onto that. And yeah, lots of documentation, lots of checks, 15-hour uh, days most of the, most of the week, um, uh, just trying to uh, figure out what we needed to keep, keep moving with, keep bringing. So then they started preparatory electrical work. Their um, 120 square cables, there's two per log. Um, that all work had to start. Um, you notice there the, the neutral isn't switched, and that's one of the reasons we had to shut the power to the building. Because that's not switched, we couldn't do any work with the building live um, from a safety point of view. So we were told. But yeah, those cables are big. They're, they have to be manhandled into place. They don't bend easy. It's a lot, it's straight grunt to get a lot of that work done. Outside then, you can see the outside of the building. Um, there's the cables running in, and they're going out uh, past the generator out to uh, prepare to the UPS, where the, where the UPS is going to go. Um, there's more of it. There's the crane. Um, he told us afterwards he was getting a bigger crane to take it out, because he said he had about maybe half a meter, and the crane was going to overload when he dropped it into place. So yeah, he bought a, bought a bigger one the next time. And that's the site where we dropped it into. So yeah, installation day, start the generator, start migrating stuff across. It took us about three hours, uh, longer than we expected, um, basically. Migrate a server. So we basically, you're, everything is, or should be dual fed, or most things are dual fed, or on, on APSs, which will take two feeds. Bring it across, check it, check the loading generator, and slow, methodically moving things across. We did the network room first, uh, and then we did the servers and the DC. And that's when your emergency lighting goes. That's what it looks like. You can see HA in its rack is still lit. Um, but yeah, that's what, and then it's like, who's got head torches? We all have head torches. Um, but yeah, everything becomes health and safety problem uh, almost immediately. Because there, there's loads of cables on the ground. You can't see them. Um, and we have to, <laughs> it's not a building site, so, but we have to really control who goes in and goes out. That's the inside of the uh, UPS itself. So at the end of the day, about five o'clock that day, UPS was in and wired. It had to warm up. I didn't know that. Uh, none of us knew this. We had to leave it warm itself up before it would actually come online fully because the batteries were cold from being in storage. Um, the same UPS, this also would do 300 kilowatts, which was same, same capacity-wise, just it was a shorter uh, runtime. The batteries were all in the container with it, and also its modular are much more efficient, which is another point I'll come back to in, in, in a, at, the, at the end um, with the replacements. But um, yeah, we had to wait for it to warm up. So we all went and stood around in the cold waiting for the UPS to warm itself up before it would come online. Uh, we got then, we also got telemetry into that as well so we could monitor it remotely, although it, it worked uh, very, very well while it was in place. Uh, stuck up some hoarding around it. Uh, you can't let people being able to access cables that have up to 120 amps going on them that they could just go and pull apart and look at. Um, because it's, uh, it's on campus, but a lot of walkers walk around the place. Um, lots of people walk dogs around the campus, so, and they do walk around the building, like, around the back of it there. Um, I was at this point, I think Dave Malone suggested this might be a good, idea, a good thing to talk about, so um, that's the reason this talk came about. Um, power back on EMC SAN, I have to say, we were surprised. It just came up, it was fine, it was happy, much to our surprise. And in the middle of this then, Log4j happened, and was like, oh, come on. So someone got diverted to deal with that. And we're only a small team, there was five of us uh, in the team. Um, and of course, because of COVID, there was various points. We were suspect COVID, so someone has taken out of the, been able to actually do stuff. Um, but you can still be useful. So then, week three, um, Sunday night, about half 11, there was power failure on, on the site. Um, we're on a spur, ESP spur. We do get power failures for various reasons. Billing went on to generator, but not everything. We hadn't twigged every device or caught every device that wasn't dual supplied. So some stuff dropped, including some client equipment. 
Um, so then, yeah, we figured out what was still off, and we were able to start acting as eyes and ears for eye check to get K back on. And uh, by that evening, we were down to 200 issues out of about 10,000 in sight in check MK. We're monitor at the moment about 11, 11,500 items in check MK at the moment. Um, so we're down to about 200, which wasn't bad. Um, we'd lost, uh, we had a, a real pain in the backside one where we lost both drives in a raid array became faulty in our OpenStack controller, which required a bit of thinking to replace that and get it working. And the other thing was we just left stuff off. Um, if no one complains, we leave it off. Um, week four, many, 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 many FSCKs. And uh, when you've attached volumes in OpenStack, and we run about 600 VMs, um, it took a long time for all those to wash through. Um, turn off as much as good for the holidays, Returned the small temporary UPSs to their owners with thanks. Um, had a power outage on December 30th. I think, um, I think Jerry had to come in for that one because all the rest of us were after having a few drinks by the time it happened. But nothing bounced, so we were good. And we'd actually had Christmas holidays uh, and we needed it. So, January, back into the office, uh, problem with the chillers. Um, long story short, when it got too cold, the chillers were switching themselves off. A uh, fail sensor um, meant free air cooling wasn't engaging, uh, which was hilarious because it was below four degrees most of the time, and it should have been, um, it should have been, uh, yeah, it was a fail sensor. Um, it took a long time to get diagnosed, and because of the holiday season, it was difficult to get an engineer on site, and other, like, we're just one site among many where there's issues over Christmas and it was, it was hovering around four degrees or, or less every night. Um, eventually figured out what it was. Our fix during the day was bring up a hot cup of water to the uh, system every hour or two and put the sensor into it and it ran away fine. Um, so we didn't really need that on top of everything else. So yeah, we reduced the thresholds in the Grafana. We Still haven't fully finished equalizing the phases. Uh, basically, there's, there's more load in some phases than others. We have a bit of work to do around that still. And figuring out the core dependencies then of systems inside uh, was one of the things we went through doing. Um, but this is only half the story um, because with the temporary UPSC and now we need to get it out. So eight months later, um, this is all planned for late September, early October. Um, Two days before arriving on the site, or the job starts, the subcontractor says, this can't be done in a day. It's going to take a week. All the plans were for a day. Um, and so that's, in theory, there's no, no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. The guys doing the work came on site and went, oh, this room's too small. Uh, we won't be able to get all the work done. So on the left, you can see the old battery room. Um, there, there's the old battery stack. Um, it's been replaced now, it's, it's much more efficient, and there's all the batteries waiting to go in. But there was a couple of guys spent a couple of days, literally, because historical decisions, batteries were on the top floor, they all had to be carried out, and the new ones carried in. Um, it was that or get a crane, and no one was going to pay for the crane. Um, so yeah, there was basically uh, getting the new batteries in, get the UPSs in, so there's the battery room itself. So the UPS came out of that, at the, out of that um, space. What's gone back in there instead now is um, one UP, two UPSs and one battery box for one of the UPSs and the, the other two battery boxes upstairs. So it took two and a half days to get the, get the old batteries out. Um, again, because this is now a five day operation, it's not gonna be done in one long day. We had to put provision in to monitor the site uh, as best we could, because um, the temporary cable is going everywhere. The building is open. Um, it is a uh, security risk, everything else. And we also don't know what the um, what other things might happen when in the middle of this, this job. So use two-way radios around the site. And when you're trying to tell people stop doing what they're doing or get out of the building, because there's a potential for something to, uh, uh, to go off, um, fire or electrical hazard or whatever, being able to just say, say it across one channel, it's much faster and safer than a mobile phone. And uh, yeah, so yeah, that day, um, powered on all our T2 servers, 
pull all the cables, shut off all the breakers, um, pretty much um, isolated everything. The two pictures there, uh, there's about two and a half hours difference between them, so it's about two and a half hours to get the boxes off the, out of the room. So the day itself, October 4th, start the generator 7.45 in the morning. Um, pretty much everything we got onto generator by quarter to 11. We had a, a miscommunication again uh, because we were shutting down uh, this, the cooling system engineers wanted to do some maintenance. When we said shut down to them, we meant the IT was shut down, not the cooling system was shut down. Uh, someone opened a valve, proceeded to blow water under pressure out of a two-inch pipe around the, around the place, which was really we didn't need. That was our fault. Um, powered down the temporary UPS system. We had to stay there overnight because um, this run on generator again. Um, we decided to do a split shift, so some stayed late, some came in about three o'clock in the morning. Um, myself and Jerry came in at three, Michael and, and, and Tibor stayed late. And we had cameras up over various places to keep an eye on things, keep an eye on the generator, keep an eye on the doors. Uh, don't want people wandering in, stuff like that, because if they wandered in to a dark data center, they're going to fall into a hole because there was tiles up everywhere. And then there's a whole world of other issues that you don't need because um, the door was open. So yeah, we uh, spent the week basically managing the generator. Uh, Trudor alarm failed, didn't like power being turned off and on, eventually failed, and it's a really good intruder alarm because we all wanted to get out of the building. It was really, really loud. Then we had to say, does anyone know where it is? How do we turn the power off? How do we kill the batteries? Because the battery's charged up and it stays making noise. Get rid of that, um, finally found that, disabled that. It actually failed completely and had to be replaced in the end. Um, so by that evening, with the UPSs on, uh, again, they wouldn't let us put load on until the batteries got charged. Then we put on minimal load, um, got lights, pumps, stuff like that back running, but still everything ran in generator overnight because we still had to recommission, test the generator, um, fail over it, that type of thing. Would have come back on, they all had still to be tested. So 9.20 in the morning, we're supposed to be um, doing the test of the generator. Um, reactivated the generator and immediately fired, and you should have seen electricians leave that electrical room at speed. Um, generator firing up wasn't something they were expecting to hear. None of us were expecting to hear. Um, there's a phase detect relay in the system. It had actually failed in that week. Don't know why. Uh, it took us a while to isolate the fault. Next problem was, where do you get one? In Escorti. So someone drove from Enescorti, someone went to meet them. We'd get that installed, so that delayed everything for a while. Then, basically that afternoon, got the generator tested, which has basically been simulated the, the mains failing because we had to know it was going to come in safely. All that done. 10 past four, all off the generator, and uh, basically uh, got back online. There was a PDU failed, um, which causes a bit of issue, and we had a lot of those fail. Again, none of this stuff has ever been really switched off. Even in Hurricane Ophelia, or ex-Hurricane Ophelia, we didn't switch off. Um, so none of this stuff has really been switched off in, in quite a number of years. So then the week three, started powering everything back up. Um, a side effect of replacing the UPSs, which was, was Jerry had to make a case for replacing them, and he way underestimated the savings. At this stage, we reckon we're saving about 45 grand a year in electricity costs, just with the efficiency improvement in the UPSs. And that means they're going to pay for themselves in three years, three or four years. So lesson learned, technical ones. Keep stuff charged. It actually is useful when the power fails to have stuff that's going to run. You also find out uh, if your batteries are gone suspect. Don't make promises you can't keep. If you be honest with people, they're 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 reasonably accommodating as long as you're honest. Um, old machines don't like being turned off. Maybe we should do it more often just to maybe see are they going to come back. Uh, it, it's it's everyone wants to leave things alone. It's work and leave it alone. That sometimes maybe is not the best thing to do. Um, everyone was under pressure. I, I'm still surprised nobody quit. Um, it, was, uh, it wasn't exactly a pleasant experience. Um, but fundamentally, it's like we, we were a small enough team. Um, we got assistance from uh, computer services as well in, in, in WIT. We know one was long enough that we can say, you know what, you go outside, just take five minutes outside, go for a walk. Having meetings outdoors when it's not raining is actually a useful thing to do. You get it, you, everyone, after about two minutes outside, everyone starts going, oh yeah, it's nice out. Uh, you're not indoors under emergency lighting with possibly alarms going off, things flashing at you, various things. 
Yeah, so um, no controlled power used by the chillers. We put a limit, there's now a limit on the chillers. They won't ramp up to their maximum because they can put a huge load on when they get behind on demand. And that was something we didn't know was there. And the heating system control that was in circuit, that was, that was an unknown unknown when this started. And we didn't actually know that problem was there. So we've since dropped our limits. Procedural, watch for exhaustion. Like I said, tell people to go for a walk, uh, meeting outdoors. Radios are very useful if you don't use them on a daily basis. When stuff goes wrong, they're much more efficient than phones. It's something we have used over the years. Um, um, and we've gotten used to using them. Uh, we actually got in extra ones for the, for the actual uh, work itself. Um, nobody got hurt. That was uh, one of our biggest relief in this whole thing because uh, there was lots of, there's lots of stuff going on. There's a potential for it, even just falling down a hole. Um, we had all our recovery processes um, all documented, but it turns out all of us had a copy, but none of us remembered what the password was. So now we keep a printed version of the whole blooming thing. Um, that was a bit of a damn it moment. Um, we did get the server back up that it was on, running on and got, ever, got, got, got the information we needed, but we do have a lot of run books that were in RTFM. Not a no strange name there, but uh, RTFM wasn't there for a while and you suddenly remember how little you actually remember. Yeah, being honest, telling the colleagues, this is because everyone was, the whole working from home thing, people have no appreciation what's after happening. So you send them a picture of fire engines outside, they go, oh, it is serious then, you're not just pulling my leg. Um, people are more understanding. Getting GitLab back was the biggest thing. All the developers, GitLab and our next clouds and own clouds, uh, that would kept most of the people happy. And uh, so contributory factors. We've kind of grown accustomed to running near the limits of the building. Um, it became a part of the daily job. Poor communication, the, um, the poor contractor who came in, he did not understand how close the limits we were operating. We didn't have, we don't, we don't have much headroom or didn't have much headroom. Didn't know we'd failed sensors. We didn't know we had, we had a hidden load that we didn't know about. Again, we now know about it. And uh, Murphy will always put his, put his uh, oar in where he can. Acknowledgements, all those people helped out, some individually, some groups. Um, to be fair, uh, Clem Jacob really did bail us out of it. We, we, we stripped them of everything they'd left in the stores uh, during, during that week, the first week. And uh, yeah, we all live to tell the tale. That's the building, and thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, John. And I'm conscious we've run over time, so I think we will leave questions for now, but I'm sure John will be happy to meet you later. But I'd like to just, once again, put your hands together. Thank John from the Walton Institute and SE2 for a fantastic talk. Thanks again. And now, time for lunch, and apologies for the delay.